Hello everyone, and welcome back to I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist, and in fact, to the finale of our first life of I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist. Because of course, as I'm sure all of you know by now, we have plenty more lives to live. There are 29 endings to this game, and uh, I fully intend to get them all. Which, <laughs> acknowledge is going to take a fair bit. But, uh, you know. We are in the middle of dust at age 19. A lot of events are probably going to happen, so it might be a bit of a longer episode, but I am determined to make this the finale. Not like how last episode of Shadowrun was supposed to be a finale. Shh. For now, though, let's get into seeing this place out. We legitimately have all of our physical skills up to 100, which means I don't need the gun anymore. Actually. Which is... kind of disappointing. I wanted that thing for so long. Um... Take a secret admirer gift got both of our medallions. We could actually save up a bit more kudos and buy something. What is this two times bonus for physical pairs? Uh, I mean, let's go see if maybe we can up our empathy. I think there's that one emoji proji. No. Here it is. Oh, okay, just plus 10 to all social skills. That one's Uticot's old hat. I don't know when that got added. Interesting. Do, 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 do. Photo phoner. I love that this is a thing. Kind of don't need the backpack anymore. We draw so many cards. Brain Trainer might be good. Plus 15 to all skills bumps up all of our, um, our weakest ones, which ironically is mostly our social. Funny, because I had said I wanted to be a politician. Hey Mars, you can have some crystals. Did that bump us up to 90? I think it did, actually. Eighty, okay. No Mars on the main screen this playthrough. You're looking for Mars, so you just follow the sound of arguing until you track her down outside the bridge. I can't believe how short-sighted you're all being, she fumes. Do you think we can just take this planet by force, by killing everything that threatens us? It's like you've never thought about anything other than your own ego for one second in your own stupid life. Who do you think you are, Lum Roars? You'd all be dead in the ground if it weren't for me and my soldiers. We're the only things standing between this colony and destruction. That's the problem, Mars retorts, sticking her finger in Lum's face. You only care about defense, and not about growth. She gestures wildly all around her. This place is a backwater. There's nothing here worth protecting, she continues. We need to start thinking about economic and social policies. Economic what? Economic growth? Economic stability? Mars, yes. That encourages growth and creativity, or all we're go ever going to do is scrape by a miserable existence on this stupid fungus rock. What do you think we're doing, Lum counters? We can't grow until the enemy is defeated. There will be time for all of your... He waves his hand at Mars' extravagant outfit. Nice jewelry and fancy clothing when our work is done. He crosses his arms looking smug. 
You think you can just walk in here and tell me what to do, little girl? You don't know the first thing about what it's like to run a colony. You just play pretend! At Mars's shocked look, he continues. Yeah, I know about you and your little club, Lum sneers. You're a rich little princess playing politics. You should go back to what you're good at. Looking pretty! Let her fight her own battles? Fuck that, she's got an ally in me. I don't care. I can handle this, Garrett, Mars says, gritting her teeth. At least I'm doing politics and not just jerking off with my buddies about killing things, Mars spits. If every eye in the room wasn't on her before, it sure is now. While Lum is sputtering, Mars tosses her hair over her shoulder and smirks. See, it's not so nice when other people do it, is it? Mudslinging politics is so old earth, she coos. But don't worry. I don't take your lack of class personally. Get out! Lum roars and Mars turns on her heel and leaves command, grabbing you on the way out. Well, nothing past that, eh? Screw it, I totally want to see Mars leave this place. She needs people with her that can, like, make sure she keeps certain things in perspective. Mars would be a great leader of this place. Uh, just more crystals for you, gnomes. Oh, right, it's, it's their birthday. A tangent. I think we can get you to 100 before the end. You're at 90. So we need a few spots where we just naturally gain friendship with her, and then... Two more presents, maybe? Uh, that might be tough. Heck yeah, let's do it. I don't even care if we, uh, don't get the, the minus stress out of it. She seems tired. You're walking with Nemi through the colony when suddenly she stops and slumps forward. Actually, Garrett, she says, I'm so tired I can barely keep my eyes open. Is it okay if we just have a nap together? That's all I want. You answer that of course it is, and Nemi looks relieved. You go back to your room and tucks you into her bed, and tucks- You go back to your room and tuck her into your bed, and she's almost asleep by the time you undress and join her. Cute. Yeah, shut up, douche. Nobody cares. Uh, I think we already talked to Cal. Is there any reason to go back out to that- awful place. No. We did everything. I did some damage myself. As Ruffer pointed out in the comments, I could have totally just stepped out of the way of that horde of hop eyes at the very beginning. But I think I did okay in mitigating some of the damage. And we raised... <clears throat> I'll double check it, but we raised the colony defense rating, so that's good. This last attack might be pretty insane. 50%. Got it up from 30. Where's me? Where's me? Ah, uh, right there. Yeah, there's me. Second Surveyor Garrett. I forgot about that. Okay, so all we can really do is just focus on upgrading some things. I'd like to get that empathy up a little bit more. And doing work of some kind. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Before we do that, I do have the option of um, helping cook. And I want to see if maybe that gives us some empathy. It does. And creativity. Sure, we'll try it out at least once. Back in space, cooking involved programming ration machines and putting dishes in the lasermatic dishwasher, because water was too precious to clean dishes with. But now you're growing more real food and trying to figure out how to cook with it. The cafeteria kitchens are bright and full of good smells. There's always something baking or boiling or frying. You take a deep breath in and just hold all of the deliciousness in your lungs. Chief Steward Anne, known to the kids as Antecedent, is in charge of everything in the living quarters. 
running the children's creche, coordinating the cleaning bots, and of course, cooking for the whole colony. It's a lot of work, but she's good at delegating to all the kids she has raised here, including you. She's a big believer in learning by trying, and doesn't mind if a few dinners are ruined in the process. It looks like you're on your own this morning, Aunt Anne says, welcoming you to the kitchen. Don't you worry, though. We'll start you off with something easy. She shows you to the kitchen's nanoprinters. Just press this button, and the ration machine will spit out a freshly pressed cake of soy rations. It's not tasty, but it's nutritious. Then she shows you to the range. A large pot of brown stew is bubbling away. Here is where the real magic happens, she says proudly. She takes a ladle and spoons up some of the stew so you can have a taste. See? For this stew, we added homegrown veggies and spices. This is what I love about cooking, she says proudly, turning raw ingredients into something better just by adding a little bit of work and a lot of love. Just like raising children. How about you, Garrett? Why do you want to work in the kitchens? I like eating real food. <laughs> I like to provide for others. It's like a puzzle. We'll go with the brainy option. There's a science to cooking that fascinates you. Adding energy, dissolving things, forming and breaking molecular- I probably should have done the middle one, to be honest. To make something new, it's so cool. You tell this to Aunt Anne, and she smiles indulgently. Sounds like I'm going to lose you to engineering, she says. I'm happy to have you for now, though. Oh, I'm literally just, like, stopping by for- Just to check it out, but yeah. This life, clearly- we got a little bit of a brainy person on our hands. Aunt Anne sets you up with a... And a combat person. Like, look at that. Max in all the stats. Uh, with a few basic kitchen tasks and leaves you to it. If you need help, I'll be just around the corner, she says. Or you can ask Congruence for advice. She has every recipe and method you could ever need. And she's an excellent teacher. Plus two organizing. Where are we at for that? Are you just not going to show me? Thank you. Quickly have your hands full with the sheer volume of food it takes to feed a hundred people. Workers from the canteen shuttle back to pick up trays of soy rations and pots of stew at regular intervals. Somehow you keep up. You poke your head into the canteen at lunchtime to see what people think about the food. Seems like they like it. Maybe you're cut out to be a chef. Alrighty. Not a rounded one, just one go. First collectible use is free. Good to know. Do we have any gems? We don't. That's unfortunate. Four, four, six, seven, eight, I guess. And then I think we can turn, yeah. Which still makes it a 49. Because we're no longer we no longer have that straight there. Eh, take it. Apparently it was the best we could have done anyway. We've got two empathy, five creativity. We're gonna get a uh, perk if we do this again. Which might be worth. Late dust. Anyone got something specific they wanna say? Tange. No, we kind of ended your storyline. Tange is standing at the door to the laboratory, looking out towards the walls and the wilderness beyond. We have done all we can, she says, and then sighs. I don't know what else there is to do. Perhaps inspiration will come to me if I work harder. Not much you really can do, my dear. No dot dot dots showing up for anyone. I wonder if there's going to be like a boss event that just kind of spawns. New boss event spawned in the rich. Okay. I'm glad I looked. Let's go to the rich. Does this have to do with the fact that we've gone to the swamp?
I'm not worried about the actual events here. We're just here for whatever this boss event is. Oh, and I think there was one collectible left to find, so maybe keep an eye out for that. I hear that thumper. Oh, did I equip anything else in place of that? I didn't. I should do that. Um... I guess I'll take the extra plus one skill on challenge wins. So we just have the two and three version of our pets equipped. That's kind of funny. Hi, Sim. Please reconsider. Let's see another thing that you like. We've given him roots before, I guess. Ain't nothing over here. I wonder if events that we had here with Dice will change because Dice is ran off to join the gardeners. So I hope we see him again. Maybe that's the boss event that spawned. Oh hey, and there's the thing we missed. Yep, this is where the city is. You see smoke on the horizon. Concerned it could be the start of a wildfire, you trek over to check it out. When you get to the origin of the smoke, you find something unexpected. Dice at a campfire. Yep. Dice looks up at you from his campfire, where he's roasting a small creature on a spit. It hasn't been that long since you last saw him, but he looks... more rugged somehow. Completely at ease. He's made a small but tidy camp here. He must have brought a lot of this with him when he ran away. He stares at you in silence for a few seconds as if gauging your intentions, before he rises to his feet. Hello, Garrett, he says warily. What do you want? Are you okay? Sure, sure, he replies with a slight smile. I know how to live off the land. Ah, Garrett is here. We hear from behind you. Oh, my beloved. They've gotten jiggy with it. Yeah, I'm okay with that. We had our moment with Sim. You hear from behind you, and you turn to find Sim watching you from the cover of the forest. He steps into the glow of the campfire, tall and ethereal in his tattered human clothing. Sim lays his hand on Dice's shoulder, and Dice covers it with his own. You can tell him the truth, my beloved, Sim says. What's done is done. Wait, you and Sim? What's going on? Dice looks over his shoulders at Sim, then back at you. There's a challenge in his eyes. Yeah, he says. Me and Sim. He understands what it's like to be different for, than everyone else. I am genuinely happy for you both. Thank you, Dice replies. He looks relieved, and you can see how happy he is to start shine through his usually grim expression. But I guess I do owe you an explanation. It is happening. Or, it's happening, Dice says. Like I said, the gardeners are going to make me one of them. The same way they can download copies of their brains into physical bodies. They can do it in reverse. They're going to make me part of the array. Being around Sim, it makes me realize what I've been missing, he continues. You know the old Earth fairy tales about changelings, right? Like, I never fit in with the colony. And eventually, I realized. I never really fit in with being a human, either. Not being afraid of death and pain like everyone else. Like every other living thing. It changed who I am. What I am. I should tell you, this wasn't my idea, Sims adds. I imagine this line would change depending on how the bombing happened, like whether it was the walls or whether it was the lab. But this would have happened regardless if DICE plants a bomb and explodes it and leaves. Not this, nor the bombing of your laboratory. That was not part of their plan. He frowns at you, arching his brow. Though from what Dice tells me about your scientist's plan to eliminate all life on this planet, I can't say I disagree with his decision. What were you thinking? Hey, I was very clearly against it. 
I couldn't let Tanj go through with the virus, Dyson says. I didn't have any time. I had to make a decision. Noctilicent and the other gardeners wanted me to blow up the colony during the next attack, so... Actually, we already delayed that. Yeah, that, that, that line clearly... Yeah, okay. Um, Dice Drugs. I just bumped up their timeline. And now I get to be a gardener too. He smiles at Sim. And I get to be with Sim. Forever. I'm not sorry I did it. Dice continues, turning away. If you came here to bring me back, forget it. Like Sim said, what's done is done. I'm not going back. My future is with the gardeners, he says. They need me. They want me. I can bring them a human perspective, you know? For all humans suck, and we're pretty good at finding new ways of doing things. I can teach them how to change things, to make them better. With that, Dice returns to the campfire. Sim nods at you, then joins Dice. You sit down beside Sim. Oh, actually, I could totally force us if I wanted to, because we have friendship 80 or greater with him. Honestly, I, I do kind of support this for him. I think, I think it, it would make him very happy, and I'd love to have him stay and benefit the colony, but I guess it really depends on if, if we're going to be able to survive with the gardeners or if they're we're going to actually have to wipe each other out. You sit down beside Sim. It was a surprise to me as well, he says, but we cannot change this deal Dice made with Noctilicent, and it may be beneficial. The gardeners are in danger of stagnating. Our slow responses to the human threat is proof we could use your ingenuity, and perhaps he may act as a bridge between us. Dice is the most singularly lonely being I have ever met, Sim says. I feel his sadness in me like a palpable wound. It awoke something in me that I didn't know existed, a part that called out for him in return. Sim looks across the flames to Dice, who is acting as if he can't hear you. Don't you want him to be happy? Honestly, I think I'm pretty okay with uh, letting Dice do this. Um, maybe in a life where we're actually romancing Dice, we'll insist he stay. Um, I support Dice's decision. Then we are in agreement. So there's only one problem. The process um, hasn't been done in thousands of years. We're going to need some raw materials to repair the interface. Are you kidding me? Dice says. I've done everything you guys have asked me to do, and now I've got to do more? Sim looks apologetic. Well, it is better to tell you this now rather than having you find out mid-upload, when your body has already been processed into a liquefied slurry of proteins and waste matter, correct? Dice makes a safe, fa makes a safe, makes a face, and Sim continues. It is metamorphosis, my love. It's not pretty. Regardless, we need three convergent domain power sources and three crystal clusters. Only then can the process begin <laughs> already caught them. Sim looks surprised. Oh. Well, isn't that convenient? And you just carry them around on your person? My guy, I have right now, less what I just gave you, 19 flowers, 7 logs, 8 fruit, 4 roots, 7 eggs, 10 crystals, 19 devices, and a, a flower from my mother. Yeah, I carry those all around with me at one go. Don't worry about it. You, Dice, and Sim strike camp and head off into the brush. Sim in the lead. You walk for about a half hour until Sim slips through the roots of some great tree and leads you down into one of the gardener's subterranean hideouts. It looks much the same as the Overseer's Cave, complete with a glowing vat of mystery goo. Dice looks surprised by the dank, drippy environs. Sim only smiles. What did you expect, he says. Gleaming, sterile surfaces, blinding lights, terrifying medical equipment. He gestures at the pool of faintly bioluminescing liquid. We are an all-organic operation, I'm afraid. Shall we begin? Shall. Dice steps forward. I'm ready, he says. What do I do? Sim gestures to the pool. Simply submerge yourself in the gel and breathe normally. It is biocompatible with your respiratory system. Disrobing is not necessary. Your clothing will be liquefied along with your physical form. Mm -hmm. 
Dice steps forward, but Sim stops him with a hand on his chest. My love, I beg you to give this your full consideration before you pass the point of no return. Once you lie down in that pool, your love as a love, your life as an organic being will be over. There is no rush. I am eternal, as is our love, no matter the form you inhabit. Dice places his hands on top of Sims. I'm ready, he answers softly. I don't want to wait. Don't do it for love. Do it because it's truly who you want to be. Don't worry, Sim says. The process takes only takes approximately three weeks. He'll be back before you know it. Sim smiles and tilts his head. Though you might not recognize him at first, he continues. His body will be liquefied, and his DNA will be merged with ancient convergent domain DNA, a simulacrum of which will be encoded into the array in order to translate his brain patterns. His consciousness will be run through simulations of tens of thousands of communal memories, and his organic material recycled. He waves his hand. In truth, the process is complicated, and physically, he shudders, repulsive to watch. Thankfully, he will sleep through it. Well, not sleep exactly, more of a... Wow. The point is, you will sleep, see him again, just not in this form. Goodbye, Dice. That's really nice art. I might make that the thumbnail. See ya, bro. Dice looks at the glowing vat, then turns back and gives you a firm hug. Whatever happens, I'll find you again, he promises. I'll always be your friend. He descends into the vat without hesitation. You watch his image refract through the glowing goo, his determined expression faltering for a moment as he fills his lungs. His last breath bubbles up to slowly pop on the surface of the pool. A peaceful look descends upon him, and he mouths something you cannot decipher as his eyes slide shut. What now? Oh, nothing, Sim replies, staring into the pool with a pleasant expression. The only thing... Ooh, typo. The only thing we can do is wait for the interface to do its job. He turns to you with a smile, unless you would like to undergo the metamorphosis as well. You did repair the interface after all and you have proven yourself a friend to me. It would be an honor to assimilate your consciousness into mine. No. No. I need to stay and help the humans. Maybe in another life we'll do that. What is it like, though? Sim shrugs. Well, it's like having your brain liquefied, then digitally slurped into a computer, I suppose, he replies. But it doesn't hurt, if that's what you mean. His smile drops, and he will give you a long look. And he gives you a long look. Your perspective will change if you become a gardener. Some of what makes up your consciousness, the chemicals and hormones in your brain, will be different, and then different again should you choose to take physical form. Your memories will still be there, but some of the emotions associated with them might be lost. For some gardeners, it can be hard to separate your personal identity from that of the planet, Sim continues. You'll feel a, st a strong drive to nurture and protect the ecosystem at all costs. In fact, you may not have a personal identity for some time. Gardeners prioritize the whole of creation over a single organic creature. An amoral worldview that I have learned causes a great deal of internal struggle to humans. Don't do this unless you're sure it's what you want. He says, looking back at Dice's sleeping face. Dice was sure. It's okay, I like my body. Hmm, Sim hums. What a coincidence. I like your body as well. He chuckles. That is quite alright, he says, clapping you on the back. It is not for everyone. Besides, I'm sure you have very important work to do among the humans, correct? Sim steps away from the pool. As for myself, I believe I will keep this form a while longer, he says. There are some benefits to it, particularly while the humans wage war on the planet. He laughs, shaking his head. When this is all over, 
I think I will spend some time as a lichen, he murmurs to himself as he walks out of the cave. It will be a pleasing change of pace. So he'll have finished his thing next month, because he said it would take approximately three weeks. A new boss event might spawn, in which case we're going to have to go back, but otherwise uh, we're going to stay in the colony. It's wet time. You know me. New present. More crystal for you. Oh, a Nomi event. You're about to challenge Nomi to a game of less laser fable, but you notice they seem kind of down today. When you ask what's up, they just sigh and scuff their feet in the dirt. Garrett, what do you want to be when you grew up? Grow up. A hero or explorer. Wow, it's so cool that you already know what you want to do, Nomi says in awe. What's that like? I've been thinking about what I want to do with my life, but I just don't know, Nomi says, pouting a little. I thought that being here mean I would mean I could find something I'm good at, but everything I try just sucks. It's boring, and I'm not good at anything except drawing and writing. Then be a drawer and writer. Before we landed on Bertumna, I thought I'd end up doing whatever was assigned to me, Nomi continues. We had this duty roster, right? And I figured I would keep working at the canteen, and then I could spend the rest of the time playing hollow games and making up stories. They frown. I've peeled a lot of potatoes. But since we landed here, I've been talking to Mars, and she's real serious about the idea that any colony worth living in needs to have artists and writers like me. They touch their fingertips together. So I was thinking, what if I really did follow my dreams? Nomi perks up a little, just talking about it. I could be a comic artist, or a hollow game designer, or a writer. Oh, I could be anything as long as I get to make stuff that people like. What do you think, Garrett? Colony needs people like that. Do you really think so? Nomi exclaims, holding their hands to their cheeks and popping one foot off the ground. Oh, I'm so happy! Did you know that in ancient times, there used to be people called bards, whose only job was to tell stories? They continue. That sounds like the best thing ever. I wonder if uh, the path each character takes throughout the game will change depending on if you've done certain friendship events with them. Like, what if I'd said, no, you have to focus on survival, and the future Nomi arc changes versus now, where I'm like, yeah, totally, be a bard. Or like with Mars, when I gave that big investment and inspired her to actually like seek change, if I'd like shut that down, would she maybe be less vocal than she is now? I am really curious to kind of see how those shake out. Hey dad, I had the chance to not be a human anymore. I didn't take it. You may have a fruit. Enjoy. New Calavent? No New Calavent. What do we have with him? 87. Uh, we're definitely not going to get him to 100, so we'll have to do that in another life. Another crystal for you? Oh yeah, and it's her birthday. That's Hella. What do we have with you? 85. Hey, Rexy. Get our hug. Give you a stick. Alright, Tange. I've got a crystal for you. No, actually, I'll give you a root. That's 92. Might be worth trying to get our reasoning up. Although I'm somewhat close to... Well, yeah, we're not going to get empathy up, I, I I don't think. Maybe if we get that one plus 15 dollar skills. But I'd like to get my friendship with Tange to 100. I mean, I, I, I don't need to force it. We'll get it eventually when we do a Tange path. Like a Tange romance path. I kind of th really feel like we need our empathy to be as good as it can be before the end of this. 
So... That only gives us one empathy. Persuasion would be nice too. It's at 47. Gives us creativity and persuasion and friendship with Tange. Yeah. Could also get our organizing up a little bit more. No. Okay. We'll do we'll do some studying for once. It's time for your end of term humanities project. Oh, we've totally done those before. Totally. T t totally. You, Tange, and Mars are all very excited to finish this project, showing everything you've learned in the subject so far. Congruence helps you come up with your project idea. Pretend you're students 500 years from now and you're learning about the first colony on Vertumna. What sources of information would you be reading, watching, or listening to in order to learn about life back then? Create one of these artifacts for future students of the humanities. We should write a textbook, Tange says during your brainstorming session. The more we show we've learned, the more likely we'll pass the class. All we have to do is make sure everything is in there and we're done. Mars rolls her eyes. That's so boring, Tan, she whines, putting her head on Tanja's shoulder. Who wants to write the literal book? We should do something funny and stylish, like, ooh, we can make a music video. Tanja looks horrified. We are not making a music video, she says, grimacing. Surely we can meet somewhere in the middle. Mars turns her head so she can kiss Tanja on the cheek. The bridge of Tanja's nose goes pink as her eyes dart to you nervously. Cute. Every band needs a bass player, Mars croons. Ooh, or a guitarist! Tanj shudders with her whole body, dislodging Mars, who giggles and relents. Okay, okay, Mars says. Let's be serious here. Tanj is right. We have to do something that proves we learned everything about this subject that's worth knowing. Mars is right too, Tanj admits. There's no shame in relying on her charisma. Ooh, 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 shoot. Shoot, 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 go up. You mean my good looks, Mars says, flipping her hair over her shoulder. Tanj looks down at her hollow palm and smiles. Truly, what's better than gals being pals? In the end, you agree to record a new segment about the colony's war on nature. What spin are you giving the news report? Creativity. Uh, no, screw that. A rebel cried down with war. I think that uh, upped our rebellion a little bit, which, you know, makes sense. Okay, an interesting bit here. Plus 10 kudos of total equals goal. That might be nice. Hmm. Plus 2 to cards with gems. is this card's value? Two. Okay. So that's not worth doing. Um, what if we go bing bing bang boom? It's not nothing. Ooh, that'll help. Six, seven, that definitely helps. Can we swing a four in there then? Oh, uh, yeah, but that'll lower that. Alright, do that. I can take a bit of a stress hit. Six, six, seven, eight, ten. Hey, we meet the super goal. So that definitely upped our creativity. And then a whole bunch from here. So plus five rebellion, gain memory, the Vertumna news report, plus five kudos. 
Friendship with Mars, Friendship with Tangent, and Kudos. You, Tangent, Mars, pour everything you have into your final project. It's a hit. You even post it on the Colony message board and get tons of comments and even a few kudos. It's gratifying to know that something you've written is being enjoyed by the people you love. Is this why old Earth poets wrote so much? Congruence's hollow projection smiles at you. Congratulations, you three. As an Earth poet once said, if you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. She invites you to come audit the class whenever you'd like. Increased rewards for studying humanities? Oh, neat. And we are at 62. So one more creativity gives us a perk. And we're pretty far away from the persuasion and reasoning ones. Midwet. We are almost at glow. Oh, did I, I didn't check to see if um, a boss event respond. I should do that. Hi, Nomi. Events respond in quiet, like there's going to be another quiet. Nothing. I might have missed it last month, though. Can we give you guys gifts again? It's probably next month. Or uh, Glow itself. Hi, Daddy. I love you. I'm sorry, mine here to, to watch us grow. Alright. I think we're good to just continue then. Ooh. I keep thinking this area is something more than just a dead end. Have an egg because I love you. How about an egg in these trying times? <clears throat> so what's the rewards for studying humanities now? Okay. Didn't seem to be anything new. And we have enough for that um, plus 15 to all skills. I think that might be worth. At the very least, it'll get us above a threshold for both empathy, reasoning, persuasion, not creativity, though. Where is it here? Brain trainer. Oh, it's 200. Whoops, my B. I thought it was 100. That makes sense. It's a pretty useful item. Um, okay, so up in creativity, at least one more point would be nice. We're here for the empathy, though. Yeah, because we didn't get any of that. We got persuasion. To be honest, I'd like to get my persuasion up a little bit, too. Yeah, sure, we'll study humanities again. Tanj flags you down for a moment in the hallway. Oh, Garrett, do you have an expedition? <clears throat> I can read, I promise. Oh, Garrett, do you have a moment? You go on expeditions sometimes, right? She asks. At least, far more than I do, or would ever wish to. So, would you mind doing me a favor? Of course. It's a small thing, really. And I'm to understand it's not terribly dangerous, either. I really need you to bring me some hop eye eggs the next time you come across a nest out there. I would ask Dice, but, well, she makes an evocative, dismissive gesture. Why? For science, obviously. It's on a need-to-know basis, and you don't need to know. Just bring me some eggs, or you can tell the chief engineer why you're holding me back. You don't need to threaten me. That's all I ask, Tand replies primly. They're quite common, if the reports from the foragers are to be believed. They tell me that they commonly find nests in the Valley of Vertigo, and it's positively lousy with them. We can probably do that next month, though I don't know if there will be any payoff for it. Uh... You know what? 
Give me a new hand. Oh shit, that one's awful. Give me a new hand. Oh shit, that one's even worse. I should have stuck with the one I had. Okay, one more. I never use these. There we go. That's the kind of thing I wanted. Even though it's basically the same as it was before. We have a six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hell yeah. Take that. That's why we used four crystals, baby. So we got a new perk for creativity. We only got two persuasion out of that, which is kind of sad, but whatever. What's our new perk for creativity, baby? Small skills boost. Plus five chance to gain one extra skill. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's something you want to get a lot earlier on. Doesn't really do much good now. No one has anything new they want to say. Can we give new gifts, though? Give gifts, give life. Nope. We'll have to do that during glow, then. Let me guess. The valley has a new... Oh. I see. Alright, we might load. I'm just going to blitz through the valley and see if we can find... Um, hopper eggs for... Tange. Otherwise, there's really no point in trying to head out. Yes, hello, the Valley of Vertigo. So, Ricky, nothing to do with uh, hoppers. This is probably nothing to do with hoppers. fact had nothing to do with hoppers silly snap ladders ah here we go you spot a hop eye nest just like tangent asked you to find they there are nine eggs inside all packaged up in what looks like a delicate spun glass cocoon you don't see the parents you break a little hole in the cocoon and put three of the eggs in your bag. They're a little gooey. You hope they don't break. You turn to leave and come face to face with an adult hop eye. Understandably, it looks spittin' mad. It drums its powerful foot on the ground in warning, and four more pop out of the undergrowth and start hissing at you. You should have known these sociable little creatures would raise their young communally. Animal Psychology. You've learned from the Holopedia that the two different sets of eyes on a hop eye have different purposes. The large bulging eyes on top are hardwired for perceiving danger, but the small forward facing ones are more concerned with finding food. If you're not food and you're not danger, you throw yourself onto your belly and wriggle away while the hop eyes stare at you curiously. When you're a safe distance away, they return at poking to poking at their violated nest in confusion. Don't worry, we only took three. We leaving the rest of your nest alone. Alright, we should just leave as soon as possible. Not doing that. I mean, as soon as possible, we'll be going back to base, but I think there's also a collectible we missed, so we might as well, like, take a little peek around. Little peeky poo. And then I'm not sure, but it's possible that for Glow, we need to. That's the Manticore event. That we need to, um. Go on a Glow expedition. So that we can talk to Noctilison. Or the Envoy or, or whoever. There's that thing. Okay, we can just leave. But uh, we'll see how that plays out. <clears throat> Hey, 
Got your eggs, girl. Make sure you're standing outside, otherwise it would have been for nothing. I don't remember if you stand outside during glow. Because most of them don't. Hey, Cal. Oh, good, there she is. Can I give you the eggs? I can't seem to give you the eggs. Let me guess, she's at 98? 97. Pain. Um, yeah, I can't seem to give you the eggs. I guess we're too late for whatever that was. Hmm. Alright, well, whatever. Hey, Nemi, you want to spend some time in together? No? Okay. Okay. Alright. Save. Honestly, this might not end up being a longer episode. I was expecting more uh, events to happen out there. We're only sneaking out to see if um, the envoy is here, otherwise they'll probably happen as an event right before the attack. If there's nothing worthwhile for being out here, we'll load and do something else for the month. Hoping maybe Dice will be out here. It's been a few months since he metamorphosized. Not doing those events again. I'll take the collectibles because I can't help not pick up things, but that's not why we're here. Nothing we can say to Simi. Simeon. This is the same event from before. Took some samples. Now that's just how we leave. What about up here? Sucks that we can't go anywhere else during glow, but makes sense. We don't really have the vehicle support. No, alright, there's no point in going out here this month, so we will load that. Just a whole whack of crystals. Alright then, um, up one of our skills to maybe another level? Nah, nothing we can really do there. So persuasion at 51. So at least we've got 50. Hmm. Kind of doesn't matter what we do here. Put us above 25. Why not? And Anne comes bursting into the kitchens, carrying a large crate. A special delivery, Garrett. She sets the crate down on the prep table and sticks her hand inside. And it's time to do my very favorite thing in the kitchen. Figuring out new ways to cook fresh food. You grew up eating soy rations. Tasteless, but nutritious. The hydroponics aboard the spaceship never made uh, enough to feed everyone, so fresh food was a luxury. Anne's always excited to try her hand at real cooking. 
With a flourish, she pulls from the box an alien plant you've never seen before. It's pale blue-green oblong and about the size of her forearm. It hits the cutting board with a disturbingly meat-like slap and immediately starts oozing slime onto the surface. Your father finally cleared this friendly little fruit for human consumption, Aunt Anne says. It doesn't even have a name yet. You could come up with something fitting while you figure out how to use it. You look dubiously at the weird fruit. As you watch, it glorps out a fresh wave of slime. Aunt Anne catches your disgusted expression and laughs. The business of eating can really turn your stomach sometimes. Imagine being on Earth. Everyone used to eat meat from living things. This is a blessing, Garrett. Who knows what we could do with this little plant? We do that now, by the way. Are those edible? Iron stomach. Ooh. I mean, I totally want to just go for it, and I guess we'll have to do two playthroughs to get both these cards, but I kind of want that one, because that's a neat little card. Uh, three wild card and gem but I guess we'll take Iron Stomach. You bisect the weird fruit. The goop seems to come from ducks under its thick skin, not the creamy yellow flesh inside. You pop a piece into your mouth. It's kind of sweet, like aloe. Crunchy and gooey at the same time. I hate when customers at work buy aloe leaves because they're spiky, and I, I kind of just reach into the, the lane of their groceries and almost always get like stabbed by the little spikes. It's annoying. I'm always amused when they put it in a little produce bag too, cause like, um, <laughs> you know that doesn't help when it's spiky, right? Just saying. I think that's probably one of the best we could have done. 52, 43, 46, yeah. Because it boosts this one, too. Could have gotten a 69. Ouch. Denied of the nice. And please, at least above 25. Oh, cool. You find Tangent in engineering and set down the bag of squelchy, goopy Hawkeye eggs. Her eyes go wide. You found them, she exclaims. That's wonderful. I was beginning to think you'd forgotten all about my request. She reaches for the eggs, but stops. Wait, what is this sound? Are they... They are. You hear a wet cracking sound coming from the bag. You're about to witness the miracle of life, Vertumnan style. What do you do? Honestly, just enjoy the magic. It's not every day you get to witness a new life being born. You and Tange watch in wonder as the gel-like shell of the largest Hawkeye egg splits like a ripe melon in the sun, spilling out a tiny squirming pink baby and a small puddle of amniotic fluid. You watch the last two eggs intently, but through the clear eggshells, you can't see any movement inside at all, not even a heartbeat. It's okay, Tange says. We only need one. The tiny Hawkeye is on its feet, well, foot within minutes, taking cautious little hops on the sleek surface of the lab bench. Magnificent, Tangent says, keeping the palm-sized hop eye from falling off the table. I expected them to be helpless at birth, like kittens or birds, not already moving around like an ungulate. Incredible. I can't wait to study them. If you want it as a pet, it's yours. Don't, don't torture the thing. Perfect. Help Tangent. I wonder if this was supposed to be done before her, um... Virus. Let me get a specimen container for it. She leaves you with the tiny clumsy thing, which chirps and blinks up at you unevenly with, unevenly with its four eyes. Well, whatever Tangent Doctor Instance are going to do with it, it's probably for the greater good of the colony. Knowing the attack is coming, as it always comes, and glow, does nothing to calm your nerve. There's only so long you can handle sheltering in your quarters. 
As the month draws longer, you find yourself almost compulsively walking the walls when you're not working, scanning the tree line for the first sign of trouble. You're there when you see them. Dark on dark shapes coming out of the forest, perfectly silent. I'm assuming that's the envoy. You watch with the lookouts as more and more figures amass at the forest's edge. Minutes pass as the horde pushes into the fire break, numbering at least... It must be in the thousands. More animals than you've ever seen in one place. Hey, what about the six-day siege or whatever that was? The ground is choked with a teeming carpet of smaller creatures, darting in and among the legs of... No. Oh no. The forest bends as Faceless emerge from its depths, followed by two more. The mood on the wall is discouraged. One Faceless required destroyed your colony. Two Faceless required an irresponsible number of explosives to take down. How are you supposed to handle three? Wait, there's even more? Ah. A familiar being cuts through the horde and stands at the front, like a general leading their army. Gardeners must come in all shapes and sizes, but you know this one from the hatred in their eyes. It's Noctilicent. Noctilicent steps forward. For millennia, I have been tasked with keeping this planet safe from invasive species. Extreme weather, plague, famine, the migration of predators. All tactics I have used to ensure an invasive species cannot find a foothold where they do not belong. Their command of the human language has vastly improved uh, a lot since you saw them last. The gardeners learn quickly. Controlling you by indirect means has proven ineffective. They say, glaring up at the row of horrified colonists atop the walls. I can no longer ignore the destruction you have caused, and the threat you represent to the planetary ecosystem. However... Sim steps out of the tree line and stands beside Noctilicent. His eyes find yours unerringly across the fire break. Some gardeners argue that you have the capacity for reason, Noctilicent continues. So I have come to offer you an alternative. Your unconditional surrender. Noctilson smirks up at you. Surrender is the correct word, is it not? Something your singular, violent brains can understand. The terms are simple. Humanity will cease reproduction, cease expansion, and in return will be allowed to live out your remaining lifespans within the bounds of your walls. Do you accept? Lum steps forward. I don't know who you think you are, buddy! His voice booms out from the wall. But you and your bullshit deal can bugger off! And keep buggering off! Until you think you've buggered off as much as you just can't bugger off any further! He points at Noctilicent. You know, honestly, this little thing, I... I of agree with a little bit, like woo woo. Mm, yeah, this can fuck off. He points at Octillicent. Then bugger off some more! This planet belongs to us humans! Now! It's hard to tell, but you think Noctilicent looks amused. Maybe they were hoping this would be your answer. And of course, with Lum speaking for the colony, it was inevitable. I wonder if you could assassinate him. So be it, they reply, and the attack begins. Yeah, we're standing and fighting. Your species is truly hopeless, Noctilicent snarls. I told them you would never put aside your egos. The wave of attackers rolls over the firebreak, crashing against the walls. Flying creatures scream overhead, and the sound of Plaz rifle fire fills the air. You rush toward the garrison to join the squads. As you run, you notice. Less than five, so our going into the swamp did prevent us from having badly defended. Uh, we're not well defended, because that would require being too aggressive. But our defense is less than ten, but greater than five. It is five. 
or it needs five or greater, five or greater. As you run, oh, rush towards garrison. As you run, you notice that the colony seems to be holding its own. Nothing has breached the walls yet, and it seems that the tide of monsters emerging from the trees has slowed. The colony looks evenly matched. The battle's not in the bag, but so long as the defenses hold, things look hopeful. You're descending from the walls when you're thrown to the ground by a tremendous rumble. A few meters I was wondering if something would tunnel. In front of you, something tunnels towards you through the mud. You have the impression of something long and dark that cuts through the ground like a shark through water. You scramble to your feet, but it cuts off your path, forcing you towards a geoponics outbuilding. It's a storage shed, mostly empty besides bales of hay used as float cow feed. It's dimly lit, but you think you see another door at the far end. The creature advances, throwing up rocks and chunks of dirt as it tunnels closer. Yeah, we need to take this thing out. I'm not, I'm not concerned. I'm really not. 104? Yeah, I'm still not concerned. 29. What if we... And then... Look at that. 70 in one go. Yeah, I told you, I'm not concerned. We built a very strong deck. That Nomi card was great to have there. Do we have anything that interacts with gems? We do. No more gems, though, sadly. 42, yeah, that's a little bit better. Yeah. Could have gotten a 56 there. Plus one colony defense, nice. You grab a rake and back into the doorway to wait for the monster to emerge. As it rears up and thrusts a long black snout out of the ground, you stab the rake down onto it, dispatching it. Before you even have time to be relieved, you spot a second one tunneling toward you. Take another step back into the storehouse and feel... heat. The building is on fire! The dry thatch roof quickly... I wonder if I should have rested on that last... ignites and rains flaming debris down on your head, filling the room with toxic smoke. The ashy heat is intense. You can feel it ripping the moisture from your lungs with every breath. You rush for the rear door, but the fire moves so fast... You're trapped as a roof beam collapses in front of you. You hear a crackling noise, then just pain and a noise like a bell. The world goes dark. You wake to chaos, a confusion of he light and heat and smoke, fire. Oh wow, big dynamic cutscene moment. Your head is pounding. You must have hit it and blacked out, but you aren't sure how you got here or what on Vertumna is happening. There's something important you need to remember. Your stomach lurches as the floor crumbles beneath your feet, then collapses. I think this is, yeah, this is the opening thing. And Nemi is the one rushing to get us because we have, probably because we've romanced her, but maybe she would have come for us regardless. Your body aches and your eyes burn from the smoke. A figure appears through the flames. It's your friend. Your friend? Wait, why can't you remember her name? She's gesturing and shouting at you, but all you hear is ring from your ears. Climb out. You try to stand up, but one of your legs folds uselessly underneath you. It won't hold your weight. Your friend pulls you out of the rubble. She throws... Yeah, this is exactly the one that we experienced before at the very beginning of the game. That's interesting. She throws your arm over her shoulder and half drags you towards the door. Through it, you see a deep, eerie twilight, dark blue and cold against the heat of the fire around you. Glow season. Oh yeah, see, it's this thing. Glowing eyes. You shake your head to clear your vision. Is that some kind of dog, like from Earth? Wait, hold on. You remember this from another life. Not a dog, a monster. It's about to end your life and probably Nemi's too. She tightens her grip on you. Biology 100... 
dodge and fight it, calm animals 100, or bravery 100. Well, we would have prepared for this earlier. You've remembered this day for many years. The choking heat of the fire, this dog creature's dead yellow eyes haunting your dreams. You've prepared for it. Specifically, you've installed an armed f fuck. <laughs> nice. You've installed an armed freeze trap right where you knew this animal would be standing when it transformed into a towering horror. As it does, you trigger the detonator. The trap sucks inward, drawing all the heat from its surroundings. The monster's feet are frozen to the floor as it instantly crystallizes, becoming an ice statue. Nemi doesn't stop to wonder how this happened. She gives the statue a solid kick, and it shatters into a million fragments. You emerge from the inferno of the shed, burned and concussed, but alive. And Emily smiles. It's good to be alive. You have your wounds tended to in the med bay. Other soldiers there are in much worse shape, but at least the battle is over. It was long and bitter, resulting yet again in the destruction of most of the sawmills and arable land. The defenders managed to repel the Xenos before damage could be done to the inner colony. Maybe the monsters lost interest before finishing the job. It's as if the planet wants you to suffer, but doesn't actually intend to finish you off. Yet, anyway. Oh good. But for now, you're just happy you've survived to live another day. And that day is... Wow, you're giving us our birthday early, eh? By the time you've recovered, the suns have returned. It's your 20th birthday. You're a fully-fledged adult now. Though in many ways, you already were, and have been, for a long time. You and your friends step out to greet the new day and start the rest of your life on Vertumna. Wait, that's it? We survived the attack and that's it? We haven't reached equilibrium with the planet, are we just at war forever? There's us as 20 as an explorer. I like the glider. I like our suit, too. Oh, and it's this song again. There's a whole planet out there to explore, and you intend to see every corner of it. It's a dangerous planet out there, but also made full of endless frontiers and new discoveries to make. You lead a survey team. What do you mean eventually become Utopia Second Surveyor? I have been for a year! And the two of you run things together for many years. She counts on your knowledge and your level head to ensure that future explorers stay safe while also respecting the planet. But what about... After a tumultuous beginning, you and Nemi finally managed to find each other. When you were just barely adults, it seemed like it would last forever. Nemi becomes security chief once Rhett retires. Her training in defense means the at that the attitude of the garrison mellows in later years young cadets look up to her with admiration, never fear. Still, defending the colony weighs heavily on her. You watch helplessly as the endless, horrible grind of the yearly attacks takes its toll on her. So I guess they don't ever neurotoxin us, they just, you know, keep attacking. When she turns to drink to help numb the stress, you're there to support her when she's ready to claw her way back out again. Aw, she became an alcoholic. You're together for a long time, long enough that when you start thinking about having children, Nemi isn't as hardline against it as she was before. She agrees to have two children, an older girl and a younger boy, so long as she doesn't have to carry them herself. Early motherhood is hard on Nemi. I wonder who carried them for her. Maybe they were just a test tube, but like donated egg and sperm and stuff? But luckily you both have antecedent to help raise your little ones. As the fog lifts, Nemi's latent skills for caring for her younger brothers comes right back to the surface. She's the most fun mom in the colony, always ready to play a game of sports ball or give a pep talk about a skinned knee. You give your son Nemi's blue scale scarring enhancement too, and he sports his scars with pride, just like his mom. The life of a soldier is unpredictable and unfortunately often tragic. The colony loses Nemi during an attack. She was still so young, as was calm, all those years ago. It's small comfort thinking that they may be together again, wherever they are. So, she lived long enough to be with us for a long time, have two children that she raised, maybe not fully to adulthood, but raised for quite a while, but still died young? Mm. But what about... <clears throat> 
Dice visits you sometimes, in forms you recognize and in others you don't. As the years pass, he becomes less and less interested in interacting with humans. You're certain you last see him as an unusually fast-growing gnarlwood tree, but by that point it's almost impossible to tell. He can't communicate with you, but you just get this feeling. You wonder what he thinks about the ongoing conflict between the humans and the gardeners. Does he attack the colony every year too? I guess you'll never know. Symbiosis, the bridge between two peoples. Undying, never aging, ever patient Sim becomes as much a mystery to you as the rest of the planet. The colony continues to buckle under yearly attacks and unnatural disasters, but Sim never wavers in his passion to learn everything about humanity. Though he remains as cryptic as always, his affection for your species only deepens. In your grief and demoralizing fatigue, you sometimes turn to blaming Sim. Why can't he stop these attacks? Why can't he argue with the gardeners to leave humanity alone? He never holds it against you, no matter how cruel your words. Every time you calm down, he patiently reminds you that his dissenting voice is one of the only reasons humanity hasn't been destroyed outright. Meeting Sim in secret makes you feel horrible sometimes, like you're being torn apart in the middle of this war. You love your friend, but the war takes its toll on your friendship just like it wears down the colony. You visit Sim as your job allows it, but over time you see him less. He doesn't need to come to your rescue anymore. You're an adult now, and you know what you're doing out there in the wilds. Eventually. You stop seeing him at all. You think he might have taken another form. Maybe he's moved on from humans to study some other animal. Or maybe the hum gardeners have given up on understanding humans. The attacks only grow stronger every year. He's probably a lichen now. Chief Engineer Tangent has a nice ring to it. It always seems like Tangent's life was laid out for her. Work hard, discover amazing things, and eventually replace Instance as Chief Engineer. However, after only a year on the council, Tangent surprises everyone by stepping down. At first, she's happy tinkering with her own research, passion projects that she's had to put aside when she was working in the lab under instance, things of little interest to the colony. Gradually, though, you notice that something is wrong. Her quarters, once so pristine due to lack of use, are jammed full of experiments. She takes her meals in her room and often disappears from the laboratory for days at a time. Any polite questions about her independent research are met with either wild-eyed silence or an incomprehensible jumble of half-formed hypotheses and streams of consciousness. Even Instance finds her bizarre enthusiasm impenetrable. She spends more and more time alone with her experiments. People begin to worry. And then, she just stops. Everything. Her experiments languish. Tangent languishes. As her friend, you're allowed access to her inner sanctum, her quarters, now completely in disarray and reeking of rotten organics, where you find her still in bed more often than not. Sometimes she's sleeping, but more often she's just lies there, trapped in a nightmarish waking state by her hypercharged metabolism. You hold her hand and talk about nothing, slowly uncovering her obsession with Dice's fate. Oh. Yeah, that's fair. Unable to see her in pain, you tell her everything you know. That you saw Dice become one with the planet, and that he's happy with his chosen life as a gardener. It's hard for her to hear. She's angry at you for keeping this from her. But it's an important first step to accepting that her brother is gone for good. You're there to support her as she grieves her broken family, and, when she's ready, to return to work in the laboratory. Her love life remains fairly private, though she's not as frigid as she always claimed. You hear from the colony gossips that she carries on with a string of casual relationships, mostly with other scientists, mostly women. She donates genetic material to a number of children, but doesn't choose to raise any of her own. She's quite picky about their genetic enhancements, obsessing over any markers of anxiety or depression that run her family. But ultimately, her children grow up healthy and in loving families far removed from Tanja's old childhood. It's a bittersweet reminder for her. 
Tangent lives and dies in the shadow of what she almost caused to happen on Vertumna. Knowing that she almost killed every living thing on the planet weighs heavily on her for the rest of her days. Unfortunately, even with genetic alteration, the human body was not made to withstand long periods without sleep, and Tangent's willful negligence in taking care of herself certainly doesn't help. She develops a heart condition in her early 60s that outpaces the healing capacity of the medbeds, and it eventually takes her life. Sad. Your friend Cal grew up, but he never lost his boyish charm. Cal soon rises to the role of chief cultivator. The responsibility of feeding the colony is enormous. Cal isn't good with confrontation, or pushing people as hard as your mom famously did. On years when drought or pests threaten the food supply, you often see him looking haggard. He deals with a lot of stress, and it ages him quickly, but his kind nature means he never takes it out on other people or wants them to worry about him. He's a lot like your dad that way. He has a string of intense romantic relationships, and eventually settles down with one of the gardeners who grew up on the heliopause before transferring to the geoponics. She's as dependable and friendly as he is, though as you get to know her on your weekly family dinners, you're often reminded of Anemone by the way she teases him. Together, they have a tidy little sum of children, and that's the only tidy thing about them. Their children grow up digging in the dirt, eating bugs, nearly getting mauled by farm equipment, and having a great time being kids. Cal dotes on every one of them. Cal himself never gives up on trying to convince people to live in harmony with Vertumna. Though his family is a source of strength, he struggles with the violence that's necessary for the colony to survive here. In his 50s, he's killed while defending geoponics during an attack. Aww. You grieve him deeply for many years. Ah, the indomitable Marzipan. With Lum in power, there is no shortage of politicking to be done. She remains a political thorn in his side until he's finally replaced with another Helio-born governor, then does the same for the new one, too. When Seek retires, Mars becomes the next chief administrator. It's a great move for her. As chief administrator, she has a voice on council, as well as a fair bit of power on her own. She's almost more of a pain in the butt than she was before. You watch proudly as she blossoms in the role, becoming the middle manager of everyone's worst nightmares. She confides in you one night over dinner that she thinks she understands why Seek was such a hard ass. The amount of power she wields is ungodly. As for her love life, Mars is never really one to settle down for the long term. She enjoys a string of lovers. Tangent, Utopia! Atta girl! Rex again, a number of people from the Heliopause. Everyone wants her, no one can cage her. She does eventually have one child, just for novelty. She enjoys being the center of attention while carrying a surrogate pregnancy, but enjoys being the child's wealthy, generous, anti-Marzipan even more. Mars remains surrounded by as much luxury as one could expect on an exoplanet, and though she complains about wanting more, she never seems anything less than happy about her life. Your dad never really recovers from your mom's death. He tries, but his smile just isn't the same. He continues to carry the weight of feeding the colony on his shoulders, ranching and farming and analyzing new native plants, trying to find better ways for humanity to thrive on Vertumna. The attacks on the colony destroy his progress every year, and the stress ages him prematurely. You watch your father grow weaker under the strain, until one day a sudden heart attack claims him in the field. He worked hard every day to see Vertumna flourish, but you have to go on without him. They'll always be with you, in the ground you walk, in the trees that give you shade, and in the cycle of life that surrounds, that sustains you. Your Hopeye is a good companion, but you're no replacement for its own species. When a herd of Hopeye roam close enough to the colony, you release it back into the wild. And, a few years later, you're greeted one morning by a whole litter of Hopeye kittens outside your door, and hop solo, proudly showing off their family. Your Vricky grows from the size of a small dog to the size of a bear, becoming more and more unwieldy, and more terrifying to small children. Before the council can force you to do anything about your arachnid octopus friend, Vriska just disappears. 
You look everything, everywhere in the colony for it, but your answer comes from outside the wall, a new Vricky nursery tree. Soon the colony is home to is host to many curious Vricky pups who call your Vriska home. Oh, that's sweet. And in my later years, the days turn to months, eventually becoming years, then decades. Before you know it, you're old. Life is tough but rewarding. Vertumna continues to challenge you and your loved ones. The attacks continue every year, getting harder and harder to withstand. And not just that, but droughts, earthquakes, diseases, storms, pestilence, and more. Some years you worry that the colony, and humanity, will be wiped off the map for good. But humans are good at surviving. The adversity strengthens your resolve. You mourn your dead, celebrate your births, and keep adapting to whatever the planet throws at you. This is your home, for better or worse. You do what you can to make it a good one. Eventually death comes to you, as it does to everyone. In the moment of your death, as your brain cells fizzle out one by one and shut down forever, a vision swims in your mind's eye. Is that a person? They seem so familiar. You feel like you know them so well. Oh, it's you. Only ancient. His arms are covered with so many data bands, so many lifetimes of knowledge. The ancient you speaks without moving his mouth, not in words, but in something like pictures. Still, you understand. He smiles. We had a good life, don't you think? There are so many possibilities, and this was only one of them. I lived my best life. There was a girl. We were so young together. Tammy, with the cotton candy hair. Such a shame to see a life snuffed out so young. He gives you a look, as if to say you were somehow responsible for this. Wait, were you? Could you have saved her? Absolutely. We have a chance to take another path to change the way our life turned out. He reaches out a hand. Come with me. Go with them. Yeah, we definitely want to save Tammy. And that's it. Thank you to all of these people that are kind of flowing by for creating the game that it's honestly a blast to go through and we'll have many future awesomeness. These beautiful songs. A little annoyed by this song in particular because some of my videos keep getting copyright claimed because of it, but it's also a good song, so whatever. Oh, and if I click on these, I think it'll open a link to their individual social medias and all that. Good old Finji. Beta testers. Is that it? Oh, I think that's literally it. I'll let it scroll for the last bit of it then. I have some issues with the way the game does a few things, and I feel like the ending was a bit anticlimactic. But at the same time, it was also, you know, life goes on. I really do like the game and its story and its characters, and I'm looking forward to... I don't know, I feel like we solved quite a few mysteries here. Why we're able to... Why we have this, this gift of... The gift that Sim mentioned, that Sim himself has, when no other human does, is interesting. I feel like that's going to be explained later. I'd like to see the different character endings, but... I'm not sure what the true ending would actually look like. Next life, we definitely need to save Tammy, obviously. I imagine she has a huge impact on things to come. Just by being there. But yeah. 
that was our life of Garrett, the chief survey, uh, the chief surveyor. Honestly, at that point, although what well, we, I don't think we ever actually replaced Utopia. There are twenty nine endings, and we got Explorer, which was apparently the ending. It was just Explorer. All these backgrounds. Definitely missing a lot of illustrations. God, this one messed me up for a while, I won't lie. I probably will never forget that. Honestly, we got a good chunk of the illustrations. Not bad. Cards. Obviously a lot we didn't get. Holy damn. Not quite as many as I thought, though. Chivos. That was scary. Reach the end of age 10. Lands in age 15. Sneak out to explore whenever time in an event. Wake up again. Start your second life. I hate you. Reach 100 rebellion. We don't get to know what life on Earth is. Or blow it up. Probably blowing up the wall. Probably turning into a gardener. Don't know. Definitely don't know. Don't know. Get all 29 endings. Unlock anemone on the main menu. These are all the character ones. Cal Strength, Tangent's Focus, Dice's Secret, Mars's Ambition, Tammy's Care, Rex's Hug, Nomi's Enthusiasm, Vase's Confidence, Anemone's Loyalty, Sim's Curiosity, and all of them. Pet Your Pet, Princess and Bear, we don't get to know, Saved Uncle Tonin, to engineering hungry no more probably solve the the famine without the heliopause showing up there's a little tomato tangent cure the shimmer disease meet sim unsure there's a little bit of a picture in each one that might give us a bit of a hint that's nomi i think so maybe setting nomi and dice up match breaker break up anemone and vase love it come between them Hard to say. I know there's um, cheating that can happen in the game, like relationship cheating. Someone cheats on someone with you. So that's a thing. Get five relationships to five hearts. Score 75 in a single hand. Get a single card to a value of 50 or higher. That would take some hard work. Win 10 card games in a row in hard mode. Yeah, we were just playing on normal. Get a flush of five fives. Win an impossible challenge in hard mode. Hard? Impossible! Mono deck. Have a deck of cards of a single color or wild cards. Collect them all. No more dreams. Unsure what that would be. Kill a faceless. It's a coup. Kill Lum, probably! Little bastard. No rain today. Peace on Vertumna. Hmm. Okay. Can I just exit? Or like can I can I save? And then what if I go to the main menu here? And start your next life, okay. Thank you to everyone who has joined me along this journey. This game has been so great for growth on the channel and that's been awesome unto itself but like i say i've also had a lot of fun and reading your guys's comments has been fantastic um we're going to take a break from exo uploads so nothing tomorrow this is uploading on saturday there'll be no video tomorrow i'm, I'm taking a little bit of a break there especially because monday is my birthday how also halloween so i'm looking forward to just kind of taking a little bit of a stress break there uh, when we come back to this, which we will be doing, uh, most likely, I don't know, we're entering Zelda month, so I'm not sure if I want to do Zelda uploads literally every day or have something going maybe on the weekends as a breather. I think for this next life, we'll keep most of it as it is, but we can still probably skip over a lot. Um, after that, I'll probably start, as one commenter suggested, just kind of cutting out most of the card games and, um, repeat stuff. 
blitzing through like that. Because I do want to get all 29 endings, all the character stuff. I, I want to completely consume this game. But either way, once again, thank you to everyone for joining me. I hope you had fun. And I will see you all next time for some more I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist.